Good morning, Hope Church. Welcome to the official first Sunday of summer. That was the quietest response for summer I've ever heard. I could have said the first official day to winter, and you guys would have moaned and groaned. So let's do that again. Welcome to the very first official Sunday of summer. Come on. Come on. Listen, I know it's going to be a stifling 96 degrees humidity at about 78%, zero wind, zero anything. But you know what? Enjoy it. Make the most of it, right? I mean, Praise God that we can sit in a facility, right? And for those of you that are online, you're probably in an air-conditioned facility as well, right? Enjoying some AC. I mean, who, who can't say thank you, Jesus, for that, right? So I just wanted to say, first and foremost, God has given us a summer to go after him. We're in the book of Romans. We're gonna unpack chapter four some. If you're taking notes it's gonna be called today, Operating in Faith, Operating in Faith. I bring just greetings from the Simpsonville campus in Greenville County. It's awesome to see what God's doing in the upstate through Hope Church and through other churches, right? Like God's kingdom is on the move and I just wanna encourage you to embrace what God's doing, what God's doing around you, through you, God is on the move. So how many of you had an amazing Father's Day last week? Very good, right? I was in a dilemma. I had a Father's Day, but it was also my wife's birthday. I'm just going to leave it at that. (laughs) Next week is red, white, and blue, and it's not my wife's birthday. No, it was good. It was good. All right. If you would just turn with me, we're going to be hanging out in Romans 4 today, Romans 4. And we've been unpacking the first couple chapters of Romans. And the first one or two chapters is pretty much, it's dealing with the wrath of God. It's dealing with like, it's like that jeweler that lays out that black velvet and, you know, you're going, oh my goodness, like God's wrath is, is there, but yet there's, there's righteous anger, there's indignation, there's all these things. But what we have to understand is that for us to understand where the good is, we have to look at the bad, right? We have to recognize there's bad news, But the only way we can appreciate good news is understanding that there's bad news. But the law, the Old Testament, was never a means of making the Jews righteous. It was not a means to do that. As a matter of fact, what's incredible is if you think about the jeweler that would lay out a black velvet, right? And then there's this diamond that's placed and it glistens, right? And there's the cut and there's the clarity and there's the color and there's all those dynamics with a diamond. There's this nugget that's in the Old Testament that's revealed as truth in the New Testament, which was Jesus Christ, right? The birth, the life, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So today we're going to touch on aspects of the law, but we're going to talk about faith, See, the Jews boasted in the law, but they were not able to keep it. You and I are not good enough to keep it. On our best day, we're not good enough. Last week, we looked at a couple foundations of our salvation. I'm gonna go into a couple terms. One will be faith. We'll touch on that today. I'll define that really quick. In in Greek, it's pistis. It's confidence. It's assurance, right? It's that place of believing without seeing. Then there's grace, God's undeserved favor, right? towards undeserving people. Then we touched on justification, the formal acquittal by God on all charges, a not guilty verdict. Then there's this big word that I can barely spell or say, is propitiation, propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God by the offering of a perfect sacrifice, which was in Jesus, for the sins of the unrighteous. So if righteousness is apart from the law, what about Abraham? And this is where we're gonna unpack Romans four. And this is where we're going. See, the Jewish Christians in Rome would have asked, how does the doctrine of justification by faith relate to our history? Because the Jews were proud of their history. They banked everything on their history. But this is the challenge, and this is where it gets a little fuzzy because that whole doctrine of justification was witnessed by the law and the prophets, but Abraham came 600 years before that. So what are we to do? 
Well, the first thing we're gonna do is have everybody stand real quick. Everybody stand, okay? Now, how many of you remember this song, Father Abraham? Do you remember this song? We're gonna sing it together. We're gonna do a couple motions because I saw some of you getting a little comfortable, okay? So, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham and I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. That means move it. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Okay, now it's going to get crazy. Right arm, left arm, turn around. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had five. Come on, I need to see some people moving. In the gallery section, oh, come on, you guys can move. Having one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Okay, you can be seated now. Why did I do that? Think about that song. I am one of them, right? There's this place where Paul was really accepting the challenge from Rome to say, do you understand that Abraham was justified. And so if you're taking notes, this is gonna be point number one. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. Abraham was justified by faith and not by works. How does this play out? If you wanna turn with me to Romans, the first couple verses there, Romans four, you can look on the screen. Romans four, one to three says this. Abraham was humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about, but that was not God's way. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. I don't know if you remember, but in Genesis 15, and I was kind of reminded of this, Abraham's having this whole dialogue with God, right? And God's, you know, laying out, hey, Abraham, this is, this is your future, and you know, you're gonna have this incredible inheritance. And he kind of stops God cold turkey and says, I don't think you get it. I don't have an heir. I don't have a son, right? And God just kind of moves him past that, says, there will be, right? There will be, right? And at that juncture, Abraham just says, amen. Yes, yes. So when you think about the word, the Hebrew word there, believed, it means amen. In the Greek, in the Greek Old Testament, it means so be it, right? It's this outrageous promise that was blowing, I mean, Abraham was in his 90s at the time, right? Like, I mean, there's, he's thinking in air. Sarah was mid eighties at this time before it all got fulfilled. There's all these dynamics where Abraham and Sarah are going, I don't understand how this promise could be fulfilled yet, yet. He said, yes, God, amen, so be it. So when was the last time perhaps you read or heard a promise from God and you said, amen? You just said, yes, Lord. I know in my data bank, I'll go back to all the things, not, not that God hasn't done some cool things, right? Like even when Pastor Jan had us raise our hand, you know, do you have a story of where God's met you, right? Yes, I have a story. I'm grateful, multiple stories, but there's sometimes, God, you're only good as the last story. You're only as good as the last time you met me, right? And I'm guilty of that. But in 2 Corinthians 1, 20 says, all God's promises are yes and amen. Are you in agreement with that? Does that resonate with you? See, this is the kind of faith God is looking for. It's our anthem of faith. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for accountant, it's a banking term. It means to put into someone's account. It's used 11 times in this chapter alone, 11 times. It also means reckoned or counted. Romans 4, 4 says this, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. So when you go to work, right? It's not like, hey, man, I just want to write you a blank check, right? You just, I love how you dress today. <laughs> wow, <laughs> right? Your eyes are extra blue today. Here's a check. You know, it doesn't work that way. Compensation is for work. It's not a means of grace, right? 
See, the Jews believed Abraham's righteousness was based on his obedience to God. That's what the Jews believed. Because Abraham obeyed, he was thus righteous. However, that's not what the Bible teaches. See, Abraham did not work for his salvation. He simply trusted God, period. Which is the question for you and I. Do you and I just trust God, period? Right? Or are we checking a bunch of boxes, hoping if I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then you know what? I'm kind of, it's that place of going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work myself into like the seventh heaven. But that's not what it's about. See, it's why it's the same way on how we are saved and how we receive God's promises. Listen to how Paul would summarize this kind of faith. Romans 4, 5 says this, but people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. I was in uh, Jordan in Saudi Arabia a number of weeks ago and I had a chance to interact with this, this gentleman. I'm gonna call him Rono, that's not his name, but it was a guy I was having a conversation with and he considered himself a good Muslim. And uh, I was just helping to better understand where he was coming from. And I, I asked Rono, I said, hey, Rono, I said, so how does that work? You know, you're, you're a good Muslim. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're adhering as best you can, right, to the five pillars of, of, of Islam. Oh, yes, yes, you know, I do this and I fast and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, I said, so you, is that good enough? Like, are, are you getting it done? Like, have you checked every box really well? Well, you know, and he gets a little worked up. And I realized that there was this tension in him because he was trying to do all the right things, but it wasn't enough. So I'd asked him, I said, hey, I said, kind of on the DL, on the down low, um, have you ever seen the man in white? And he looked at me. And for those of you that are not familiar with what I'm speaking of, the, the man in white is where Jesus is appearing in so many dreams and visions to Muslims, especially in the Middle East and that part of the world, having these encounters, like really calling them to places of encounter with him. And many times even directing them in the dream or vision to addresses or other people of faith. Very much what happened to Saul and that Paul conversion. And he said, hey, on this day, this is gonna happen. And then Ananias, you know, God meets Ananias and Ananias meets him. That's a whole story there. But the reality is he said, no, 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 I, I, I haven't. But he, he got a little nervous. And I said, you know, there's someone that really wants to get to know you and you don't have to check a lot of boxes. And it was a moment, it was just a moment. I can't say he got on his knees, converted, gave his heart to Jesus and we baptized him right there in the desert. Wouldn't that have been a great ending to the story? But it was a seed that was planted, that's all it was. But it was a moment, right? It was a moment. Paul again moves into Romans 4, 6, and 8. Before I go there, though, that whole thing that I just shared, even about where people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners, this would be super offensive to any Jew or anyone who bases righteousness on works. Totally offensive. But think about this. This is David, okay? Paul brings David to the witness sand. It's Romans 4, 6 to 8. This is after his, his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And we'd kind of touched on this word impute, which is really an ascribing or an assigning to someone by virtue of a quality that was in another. And these are David's two amazing statements. God forgives sin and imputes righteousness apart from our works. See, even how we are in, if you think about even how perhaps performance contracts are set up or even your compensation, it's all about you perform at this level, this level, and this level, and then there will be some level of payout, right? That's not what's happening here. 
Now the Jews are wanting to check the boxes. Well, if I obey God, then this can happen, this can happen, and this can happen. But let me ask you something. Have you ever disobeyed God? One of us, that's maybe two, right? I mean, let's just be honest. We have, right? Does that, is that the end game for us? All of a sudden, are you just cut off? For those of you that are parents or grandparents, right? And your kids or your grandchildren do something that is wrong, okay? Let's tag it what it is. It's wrong. Could be downright evil. Do you cut them off? No, it might grieve your heart, but you still have open arms and you receive them in. And that's what David was speaking to. He's like, do you recognize what geez, God has done for me? How he's blessed me and all my junk and all that I did in my adulterous affair. I mean, I even had Bathsheba's husband put in front to be absolutely decimated so that I could have her. Why Hollywood has never made an epic movie about the life of David, I will never legit know. But they want to make one about Noah that's so off the rails, it has nothing to do with Noah, right? That's just my two cents on Hollywood. So am I saying that Christians do not sin after salvation? No, yes, we do. We do sin, but we come to places of repentance, right? To stay in right fellowship with God. This is what's wild. He keeps no record of wrong, but he does keep a record of our works and will reward us at his return. Think about that. If you're taking notes, number two. So first, right, Abraham was justified by faith, not works. Number two, Abraham was justified by grace, not the law. Abraham was declared by God to be righteous. Think about it. Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah was 89 years old, right? And they had a child. I mean, that was like crazy. How's that even possible? And even in Romans 4, there's this touching on circumcision. See, circumcision was a sign that the Jews used for righteousness. But circumcision had nothing to do with Abraham's justification. Then why was Abraham circumcised? It was a sign and a seal. And I'm gonna share a little story about that. But in Romans 4, 11, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous. This is Romans 4, 11. Even before he was circumcised, so Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith, but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. We were living in Africa. There was this gentleman by the name of Mohammed that had come to faith and um, he was a leader in his tribe. And when he came to faith, it was like everybody around him came to faith too. Not just because he was a leader, but he had such a radical conversion and he'd been so militant from an Islamic standpoint that it just changed. Like the fiery Mohammed that was anti-Christ and anti-everything became a lover of Jesus, right? And so he took some of these scriptures so literal and he said, for all of you in my tribe, that have come to faith in Jesus, we're gonna get circumcised. Got real quiet in here. And so they did. Now my dad said, no, you don't have to go down. He goes, no, no, I need to. Now I'm not here to tell him he should or shouldn't, but they did. All the men in his tribe that had come to Jesus. And you're like, well, that's just crazy. You know what? I can't speak to his conviction, but it was real, right? And then why do I say that? Because the circumcision did not add to Mohammed's or Abraham's salvation, but it had merely attested to it. The sign, it was evidence that he belonged to God and believed his promise. The seal, it was a reminder to him that God gave the promise and would keep it. So what does that look like in the new covenant? Well, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? And there's a circumcision of our heart. Now we can't see our heart, but man, there's times we can feel it, right? There's times your heart's beating out of your chest. There's times you're in situations and you just sense a deep love. You know, there's burdens that come when you're like, oh Lord, how do I navigate this, right? But God is wanting to meet us in our heart. If you're taking notes, point number three, he was justified by resurrection power, not human effort. And this is something that I think is huge. 
How many of you feel like you go above and beyond and everything? Like you are a self-made man or a self-made woman. I'll put my hand up. I feel that way at times, right? Like I'm gonna get it done. Worst case, right? I might turn it over to Jesus if I think I'm missing one thing, right? Just to be honest, right? But God many times will bring us to the end of ourselves. See, he waited for Abraham and Sarah's natural strength to so wane, to so almost be unavailable that it was at that point that he gave them a son. Would you say that's potentially part of your story? Has there been times in your life you were doing everything? You'd accomplished this, you had this success, you'd moved in this direction, but then there was this thing where there was almost like a stripping away. It was like a peeling back of the onion and God was wanting to break you down to bring you to a level playing field so that he could receive the glory. He could receive the honor. And that is what happened with Abraham. Because see, Abraham in a lot of ways was a self-made man. He was all that. He was, he was a good dude. He'd done amazing things. But he had no heir. There were these promises that he'd said a man to. So be it, God. Yes. But how without an heir? And as God stripped him down, it came to a place where him and Sarah were able to have a child by God's grace so that there would be a future even like that song we sang. So how do we exercise the same faith that Abraham had? How do we do it in 2024? If you're taking notes, number one, we need to stand on the promises of God even when it doesn't make sense. Have you ever had to stand on something and it doesn't make sense? This makes no sense. I'm not even sure why we're doing this, why we're giving ourselves to this. This is foolishness, right? Romans 4.18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Abraham hoped against hope. Why does this matter? I want to share something with you. I'm not sure if you're aware, but the 80th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 1944, was just a couple weeks ago. And I was looking at this about hope, Abraham hoping against hope. I I was reminded of the French resistance. If you haven't done much study on the French resistance, not that I'm some expert on it, but it's very interesting to recognize that France in its own right in the 30s and, and before Hitler came on the scene had a legitimate army. They were a force to be reckoned with, Right. But when Hitler instituted the Blitzkrieg, which means just a a movement so fast where they would come in and just decimate, they took France over in six weeks. Six weeks. Just ramrodded over Belgium, right into France, marched right into Paris. Six weeks. They say there was about 300 to 500,000 French, which is a very small number, maybe one and a half, two percent of the French population at the time that were part of the French resistance but I want to read this to you, and I think it speaks a little bit to this when we put it in current terms. In May 1940, the German army swept across Belgium, the Low Countries, and France, overwhelmed by the new tactics of Blitzkrieg. The British expeditionary force was evacuated from Dunkirk, and the German army took up occupation of Paris by the 14th of June. In the period running up to D Day, France had been occupied for four years. Any country occupied in this way would need established new procedures of civic administration, leading to some degree of association with the occupying forces. The French people adapted to the new regime. Equally, the occupying power imposed regulations on the French population to ensure obedience. The only hope for freedom was an invasion by the Allies, an invasion which would naturally come across the English Channel. Through the years of occupation, it became apparent to the people of Europe that a new force was growing across that channel, hoping against hope. A steady increase in aerial activity showed them the occupying forces had an adversary to fear, and so hope was kept alive 
and resistance could be encouraged. I thought this was pretty interesting. I hadn't seen this before, but in July 1940, Prime Minister Winston Churchill announced the formation of a new force, the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. This represented a new style of warfare to include espionage, sabotage, and resistance. Churchill's instruction in this new organization was for them to set Europe ablaze. And they say that if it hadn't been for the French resistance, that when what had happened on D-Day on June 6, 1944, there would have been no way for the Allied forces to sweep so hurriedly across Western Europe towards Germany, right? So Abraham is in this same place, right? He's, he's feeling like things are stacked against him, but he said, amen. He said, no, look, there is a God that has made promises and I stand on his promises. That's why hope always reinterprets your circumstances. It reinterprets your circumstances. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 3.20, it says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly above, beyond, abundantly, all that we ask or think, that is Jesus. Number two, how do we exercise the same faith as Abraham? We have to die to our ability to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. We have to die to that ability. I had a pastor by the name of Pastor Brian a number of years ago, and he would say, Rich, you just need to die well. Don't you just love that? That just sounds so life-giving. Just die well, right? But why? Because if I'm living, right? If I'm living and it's about me, how can I truly die to my ability, right? And let God, God will allow you to go down certain paths. There's no question, right? But he wants, to, uh, he wants you to die of your own so that he can bring life to you and say, now I can work with Rich. Now I can do what I desire to do. And that's what Abraham had to do. He had to die to himself. And that's why salvation works. See, God waits until sinners are dead and unable to help themselves, right? I had a friend, he was a hardcore alcoholic and druggie, just went through all kinds of crazy stuff, got radically transformed, right? And he became an incredible sponsor with the AA, just just an incredible sponsor. But he had such an uncanny capacity to recognize when somebody was either at the bottom of the barrel or hadn't dropped yet. And there'd be people like, you take this guy on, you take him on, he'd be like, no, 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 he hasn't hit the bottom yet. And he could call it 99% of the time. Like it was crazy. This guy was like next level. I'm like, dude, I, like that's incredible. But when they had hit the bottom, he would bring them under his wing and walk them through stuff. And, and it was like transformation after transformation after transformation, right? Because they had come to the end of themselves. See, as soon as Abram considered himself dead and unable to perform, that's when the power of God went to work in his body and Sarah's, right? That's when that happened. As a matter of fact, my wife and my oldest daughter will be with us. Second service, they don't get to come a lot. I know I talk about my wife and my kids a lot of times, but they're gonna be able to come this morning, second service. But for my wife and I, one of the things that, We'd struggle with when we got married, you know, we had taken some precautions for a couple of years and then we tried to have kids for like five or six years and nothing happened. I mean, like it just didn't happen, right? Like I could have friends that would say, well, we're gonna have a baby in June and they'd back it up nine months. And I'd be like, this is crazy. Like, I, there's no way, right? Like it just didn't happen. So Annette and I started looking at fostering and adoption in these situations because we just didn't think we could have kids. And I'll keep the story really brief, but through the grace of God in situations, we had really came to the end of ourselves. And we're like, God, if this is not what you have for us, right? We're gonna go a different direction and that's okay, right? And when we came to that settled place, right? And there's a miracle kind of in how that played out. All of a sudden I find out that my wife's pregnant. She calls me on the phone. She goes, you won't believe this. I didn't believe her. Like this is how sensitive and empathetic I was as a husband. I was like, I don't believe you. I hope you bought more than one pregnancy test. Like, Rich, you're hard. Yeah, I'm con- I-, I was heartless. Um, so she took another one. I got home and she was. I'm like, there's no way. Because you got to think about it. years after years. Think about Abraham and Sarah. Year, we're, we're never going to have an heir. We're never going to have an heir. How, how are these promises? I want to believe. Yes, I've said amen. Yes, I've said yes, God. But how's this going to play out? 
And I remember feeling that way and I was nowhere near that age, but I was feeling that way. Have you ever felt that way? Romans 4, 19, and Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead and so was Sarah's womb. Think about that, man. And this is a reminder to all of us, Romans 4, 20 and 22, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promises. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Remember in Jeremiah 1, it says, I am watching my word to see it perform. Matter of fact, the almond tree is the first tree that blooms. And I found this very interesting of all the fruit trees in Israel, but it's the very last one that produces fruit. Think about being an almond tree farmer and you know it's blooming, right? And then all these other ones, they bloom a little bit later, but they're already harvesting. And you're sitting there going, is this thing ever going to pop? Is this thing ever going to happen? Right? That was Abraham and Sarah's story. And maybe that's been your story. See, Abraham had young faith in old age. And this just isn't to talk to a group of older people. But this is a reminder for you that maybe there's been dreams, there's been visions, there's been things in your life that perhaps you found yourself bearing, putting away, because ultimately you're just not sure, God, is this going to happen? In Habakkuk 3, it says, write the vision down, though it tarry, wait for it. What has God given you? What has he put in your path? It almost seems impossible. And you might even say, well, I'm already so past the point of of being able to be successful or being able to, to fulfill. I'm, I'm a grandparent. I'm, I'm a great grandparent. I'm, and my dream seems so not possible. Abraham had young faith in old age. Have young faith, right? Where does it say in scripture, don't come to Jesus as a young child? Well, when you hit about 24 and a half, you need to slow that faith thing down a little bit right? Because you're just not going to get the answers you were hoping for because you've passed the age of no return. That is so not God. I'm blown away by people that come to faith in their 50s and 60s and 70s, even though many times I think they say only like 2% of people come to faith after they're 70 years old. But when you see them come to faith and they just go after the things of Jesus, they just go after it. I'm like, Jesus, let me have that kind of faith. Let it not wane in my life. Let it not wane. Romans 4, 23, 25, it says, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right before God. If you're taking notes, I'm gonna give you a couple of verses. We call it the Romans road. If you think about it, the Roman empire, the roads, the physical roads they actually constructed allowed for the gospel to go to all parts of the earth. And the Romans road is a very simple way to lead people to Christ. In Romans 3.23, if you're taking notes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then you shall be saved. I'd like to invite the ministry team up at this point. Try to be sensitive to your time this morning. I don't know where you are in putting your faith in Jesus. Maybe you're like Rono, that guy in Jordan and Saudi that I had connected with that felt like he was doing all the right things, but yet there was such tension and he he, he knew he was missing something. Maybe that's where you're at. You've done a lot of good things. Matter of fact, you're just a poster child for success. But there's that missing piece that God wants you 
all to himself. Like that old song or older song by Carrie Underwood, you know, you're at the end of your rope and it's like, Jesus, take the wheel, take the wheel. Why? Because you've come to the end of yourself. God wants all of you. Think about the French resistance. You know, they, they'd done everything they could do, but they were being ramrodded by the Third Reich. But they kept hoping beyond hope. There's a possibility that perhaps we'll be free again. God wants you to walk in freedom. He wants all of you, not part of you, not 95% of you. If you're under the sound of my voice, you're like, Rich, I've never bowed the knee to Jesus. I've never made him the number one thing in my life. I've done a lot of other things. I've put a lot of other things as the number one, but not him. Would you be so bold in the setting here? Perhaps you're watching online. and Would you be so bold to stand and just say, I need Jesus. Anybody under the sound of my voice that would just say, I need Jesus. I need him in my life. See that, man. Yeah, come on. Thank you for your boldness and your courage. Would anybody else like to join this man that just stood and said, I need him? Anybody? It wouldn't be right for me to dismiss and allow you guys to walk out of this place and just go through another Sunday and not give you an opportunity. Do you recognize that angels are rejoicing because there's another that is entering into the kingdom of God today? Do you recognize that? Anybody else? I don't want to miss anybody. Anybody? It's going to have you pray with me. It's not a mystical prayer. We can all just pray this together. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender all. I repent. I turn from my wicked ways and I lay my life before you. Take my life, make it whole. For your plans for me are a hope and a future. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Can we give it up? Come on. The reason I've invited the ministry team up as well is because you might be in a place where you need financial provision. You might have a prodigal. There might be somebody in your family that has just gone off the rails and they need an encounter with Jesus and you wanna stand in the gap for them. Maybe you need healing in your body. The altars are open. As I pray, you will be dismissed. You're free to go. But I'm gonna encourage you because the ministry team is here and I like to call this sacred space, that you would fill the unction to say, you know what? I just need prayer right now. I need to stand in the gap. I need to believe for the more that he wants to do. So as I pray, know that you're released. But if you'd like to come and receive prayer, that is available to you. Lord, I thank you for everyone in the sound of my voice. God, I thank you for their willingness, Lord, just to set aside this morning to be here, this, this first Sunday of summer. Lord, we celebrate summer. We celebrate new life. We celebrate each and every breath you give us. And Lord God, if we're in a place of need financially, Lord, meet us today. Lord, if, there, if we need healing in our body, meet us today. Lord, if there's prodigals, those that have ran away from you, just, Lord, Lord, turn their back on you, Lord God. We stand in the gap for them today that you would meet us where only you can meet us, Lord God, that it would be accounted unto us as righteousness. We give you glory and honor in your name. Amen. Have an awesome Sunday. Again, the altars are open. God bless.